All right. Small but mighty team here. I like it. It's great. Uh, so I'm going to welcome to the stage uh, two people. Um, we're going to be doing something very cool. Uh, we've been talking about this for the last six months or so, so I'm, I'm pretty, pretty excited about it. Uh, but I want to welcome to the stage uh, our CFO, so the CFO for Pros, uh, Stefan Schultz. Stefan, come on out. And then, uh, and then also welcome Stephen Uman. Stephen is the managing uh, director for the commercial business in Microsoft US. And so, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, what you may or may not know is that we did a, we did a really cool webinar uh, in February. And uh, in, the, in this webinar, um, um, the, two of, the three of us had an engagement where we were talking about what is the CRO perspective in an era of profitable growth and what is the CFO perspective in an era of profitable growth. And so, Stephen is our CRO and Stefan is our CFO, although just for fun, maybe I switch you to, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so, and, and what we did is we had this really great discussion and we did it as a webinar and it was February. And we thought what we'll do is we'll do part two live on stage here at Outperform, which is where we are right now and what we're doing. And then we're gonna do another one this fall. What's so amazing is we were talking about this as we were briefing for this yesterday, is wow, the world has changed uh -huh. so much since February, it's almost unbelievable. And even this week, the things that have changed, like there are some announcements that I think that are public now coming out of build and the stuff that we've been talking about. Uh, and so we're gonna have a lot more to talk about today. And then we're gonna do another one of these in the fall. And I'm almost afraid, uh, like almost actively scared about how much different the world's gonna be a few months from now. But we'll, we're not worried about that right now. Uh, we also think uh, we all got um, an award, I think, for originality in Dress Today. We honestly did not coordinate, uh, <laughs> but we all sort of dressed this way, and we were talking about it backstage, and we thought we went through this all, we went through the similar thought process of how to sort of dress today, and so we all showed up in white shirts and relatively <laughs> similar outfits. Uh, so we're going to sit down. What we're going to do is I'm going to lead a discussion. Um, we're going to maybe go to the next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we talked about in the last session. I'm going to lead a discussion for about a half an hour, uh, but then we're going to take questions, and we're recording this, and we'll kind of turn this into part two webinar, and then, um, and then you can see us again in the fall. Um, but I think what was interesting about the conversation that we had in February is we were, we were talking about profitable growth. And what was, I think, I think, if anything, the world has become more focused on profitable growth, not less focused. Uh, I think it's gone from a thing that people need to think about when we were talking first time to the way business is going to be for the next foreseeable future, let's say eight to 10 years, right? And so in that sort of context, you know, companies need to operate in a very different way. I think the other thing that's happened, which um, I, I, think, I think is fascinating, is that the AI revolution is making it harder to argue that you don't have enough resources to get things done. I probably shouldn't sort of show my cards with you like this, <laughs> Stefan, but, but it does feel like when you say, well, I need more copywriters, it's not an insane answer to say, well, why not use AI to do that, right? right. How can we be more efficient using these tools? And so the efficiency argument becomes a very logical one. So that's a, a big change. Um, the second thing that we talked about a lot was how do CROs and CFOs work together? And, and this is something where, you know, how to get these two disciplines uh, more connected because profitable growth has got a revenue component to it in the growth and obviously the profit side is how do you manage margin uh, both cost and price and uh, traditionally the two roles have not been super tightly connected and I would say that we're also observing a change in the way that the CFO and the CFO function are behaving in the organization which is more strategic and the way that they're going to need to behave in the organization which will be more connected so that, that was another key theme and then, um, and then the last thing, which is, you know, I think kind of part of all the tech stuff that we're talking about is just how does collaboration happen? How do we collaborate at speed? Um, how is it gonna work in a world where we're gonna continue being hybrid? And I would say one of the, one of the things about the CRO, CFO relationship is it's not unusual for them not to be co-located. CROs are often not in the head office uh, or are often traveling and yep. moving around, and CFOs are often in the head office. Mm -hmm. And so that, that sort of has, I think, maybe been potentially a barrier over time. So that's kind of where we let off, let off last time. I thought maybe what we could do is, 
Um, we've got a couple of great quotes, so uh, we'll throw up, uh, uh, Stefan, we've got one for you, and Stephen, we've got one for you over there. And we're just going to kind of leave those up on the screen. Those are kind of key quotes from the last one. And uh, let's just sort of like, you know, kind of mow the grass again a little bit and sort of talk about these themes. And then let's go to the next level, which is where are we going with new tech and how do we all work together? Okay. So who would like to start? Stephen, you look like you uh, look ready uh, and then... Yeah, I can definitely start. So... I guess the, the first thing I think about is, for, regardless of technology, right, we have to think about where we are in the world. So one of the things that we were discussing yesterday is the speed at which the conversation that had happened, I think, I don't remember, it was February <laughs> when we did the last one and where we're at now. And I think one of the quotes I was talking about is faster, better, all this type of stuff and this, this velocity of speed. And today with AI, I feel like it's not about speed anymore because we're in the present, right? It's the second you can think something, it is. And so it's not even, we don't even have the luxury of what I feel like time anymore. It's we're living, the second you think of something, it's like, it, it's there. Um, and that's probably the biggest shift in my mentality just in the last few months is, is the, it's, time is, is almost irrelevant. It's we're all living in a very um, now, like we have to be in the now, the present more than ever. Um, and so it's, uh, that's probably been one of the biggest shifts mentally for me, um, especially on, on the revenue side, when you think about close cycles, you're thinking about, oh, you, you look at your days, um, days of sales outstanding for an opportunity, all those kind of things. And it's all, it's all now. So, uh, Stefan, so you had a great day with analysts yesterday, mm -hmm. um, and yep. there are some public reports that Andres was like circulating this morning. I don't know if I can talk about sure. those or not. Those sure. were public. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, congratulations. Oh, Sounds thank like you. You did an amazing job. Uh, I love how they were using the word outperform in describing our sort of financial projections, which was fantastic. Um, so, so talk to me a little bit about how things have changed since February on that front. Yeah. And then how again. You know, kind of same kind of comment that um, Stephen was making, like, how are we thinking about the way that we're managing profitable growth as a company? And then, then I want to talk a little bit about how we help others. But Yeah, well, to your point, one of the things we like to do at Outperform is, is invite our investors uh, to come and be a part of this because there's so much, so much to our company that's hard to explain in a 30-minute or an hour-long conversation. Right. And you get so much more when you're able to talk to our customers, you get to talk to our sales leaders, you get to talk to our partners. There's so much value that comes from that. And so we love having our investors attend. And, and, and yesterday, you know, we took time to share with them our view of what we think for the next three years. And, and uh, you, know, we're, we're, you know, we're very pleased with where we are and where we think we're gonna go over the next three years. So uh, I, think, I think our investors were happy with that as well. I think, you know, going to the, the topic of profitable growth, it's hard not to think about those individually, right? It's, it's um, like when I profit hear- Profit and growth? Yes. Yeah. When, I think, when I hear profitable growth, as a finance person, I tend to gravitate to profit. Mm. Surprise, Interesting. Okay. right? Um, and I'm sure when, <clears throat> when Stephen hears profitable growth, he hears the word growth. You know, I mean, that's gonna be the first word he hears and profit's gonna be the first word I hear, but it's an and, not an or, mm. right? right? And so if you think about what Stephen just talked about and how the speed of business is moving, it is now, it's not seconds, it's literally instantaneous. We have to rely on relationships, we have to rely on uh, a, an involvement with each other to understand what we both need to be doing. Because with, the, with my tendency to emphasize towards profitability, I could over tilt and cause us not to be in a situation to grow. And we can do the exact opposite. But the only way we can solve that is in, and especially in an era of where speed is so important, is for us to have a dialogue and a relationship where, you know, I don't want to kind of make it overkill here, but where he can almost finish my sentences and I can almost finish his sentences because we understand that we, both are important. And there's decisions and investments we have to make that's going to drive profitability, but it's also driving growth. We can't, we can't ignore one for the other. And so... Um, I think that's what makes this, this era we're in so unique, so challenging, um, and, and fun, to be honest. The key well, word that you just said, hitting the nail on the head, where the teeter-totter, the, the word I heard was investment, meaning 
if you're going to go for growth, you have to be very clear with your finance partners, then this better be an investment and we have an expected ROI yeah. because otherwise it better be profitable. Because if it's neither, then you're just burning cash, right? Yeah. But it's the word investment. That's where the <clears throat> balance lies. Um, but that's what I just- No, I, I love that. I love that sort of construction. There's a, let's just sort of see if you resonate with this, but it has felt to me that often we get into two camps where um, the sort of more profit-oriented camp will be like, we need to spend less. Mm -hmm. And the growth-oriented camp will be like, well then, okay, fine, then we're not gonna grow anymore. Yep. And it's like, I think we've got to bridge that. And one thing that I would observe with what we do here at Pros um, is that it's funny how often what we do falls between the two functions. I've actually talked to a number of customers where they're managing us through the IT function which I thought was interesting. Um, I, can, I know IT is super duper important in terms of managing and running it, but it's interesting that the function that would be in charge of it is IT. Mm -hmm. and, and, but then what function is in charge of managing pricing? Because one of the easiest ways to drive profitable growth is to get more out of your current customers and to make sure you're charging the right amount of money for what you're selling but it's often a function that sort of falls into sort of another land that no one ever looks at. And so I've, I've always argued that most companies underprice. And I think a lot of companies are finding as they start taking price increases, there was a lot more room in their pricing than they ever thought. Yeah. And there's a great article in the Wall Street Journal just about a week ago saying companies are finding that they're pushing higher prices out there and they're not getting pushed back. And they're like, geez, we could have always taken this price up. We just never thought about it. But how would, in this world, how do you think about this in, from, in a context of what we're doing at Pros and Stephen, what you're doing at Microsoft? Like, how do we bridge that gap? Who does run that? Is there a new department that needs to be created? Should it live in finance? Should it live in the sales function? I'll let you go first, Stephen. I'll, I'll tell you how I run my organization because one of the transformations that I really want to focus on when I came to Microsoft is almost identical to what you're speaking to, which is who's, instead of the function of technology, who's owning the outcome, right? Great way to and put so it. when I build my organization, you know, I have a whole separate portion of the business that are very focused on the technology, right? It's customer facing. And one of the biggest difficulties we had and I still have today, is changing customer perception of who Microsoft the brand is. Because if an email gets sent out and you see an at Microsoft email address, the first thing is, hey, send them to, to IT, which is not the brand we want in the marketplace because I have a whole separate line of my division that's more like the consulting, the business, the people, the process, the outcome. And knowing and having customers know that pros, Microsoft, we understand these outcomes and we understand the outcomes before we worry about the technology. Um, I think that's, it's, it's always a struggle to change that perception in the, the marketplace, but it's what, how I, how I look at it through an organizational lens is what's the function of the outcome? And that's how I build, build, my, uh, build my organization. So how is pricing done today at Microsoft? How do the CFO, CRO, how does that collaboration work? Uh, it's phenomenal. So I have a local control. Like we, we literally have the same report, same everything. Um, everything is done in lockstep. It, it was funny, right, right uh, in between the, the last panel and this, I'm, I'm calling my uh, local controller because they're like, hey, you know, d does this make sense? You know, we're looking at it and I'm just pulling up the reports right there, they're mobily. And we, we're all on the same um, wavelength. And so it's all done um, across multiple groups in the same, same format. And then just, you know, not to try to horn in on the CRO, CFO conversation, but, you know, the CMO, how do you think about the CMO helping you drive growth? That is a phenomenal question and a very astute question, right? Because you think about, and actually there's one extra added person in this is, is product, right? You think right. about the combination between the brand and the marketplace, lead generation, um, you know, sales like the execution function, making sure we're executing profitably, right? And making sure that our entire teams know the ins and outs of our product so we are representing the value, representing the outcomes appropriately. Um, 
I think of them as synonymous, like they have to be all part of the same circle. Um, it's the only way you can succeed. But I think it's fair to say there's not really a thing that people work on this. There's not a sort of single platform. You know, the, what analysts are saying, we had an analyst meeting, an industry analyst meeting yesterday as well, and they're talking about this new category of profit and revenue optimization software. And I think we could, we can argue, I think very successfully, that we're the most complete platform in that space, but there's no complete platform in the space, right? Like no one's, no one's checked that thing off. Um, but you know, we're at the early days of a new category. That, you know, when you think about that, and you think about the, how sort of a CFO, CRO, CMO, CPO collaboration occurs, you know, what, what would you need to make that work better? Um, Stefan, like, you know, we, I think, collaborate well, mm -hmm. but we're not collaborating on any kind of platform. Right. And uh, we, we use Excel a lot. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but we're, it doesn't seem to, I don't feel like you and I are able to, like, kind of turn the dials, right, and sort yep. of see what could or couldn't happen. What would that look like? Can we just, like, let's imagine on that a little bit. Yeah, you know, uh, as you posed that first question, uh, I'm reminded of early in my career, uh, we had an organization called the Strategic Pricing Group. And um, that group actually reported to marketing. Uh, oh, interesting. In, in that time period. It was part of the product marketing. It was a kind of a derivation of the product marketing function. And um, the company I was with ultimately did away with that as a part of the cost-cutting exercises and things of that nature. So to your point, I think the pricing discipline is, generally speaking, an underappreciated discipline. Yes. Um, and I, I can tell you, I, I remember I had left the organization when the, the strategic pricing organization uh, was, was disbanded. And I remember thinking to myself, man, what a, what a, what a casualty that is for, for that business because um, the, that, that group was, while it reported into marketing, to your point, Stephen, uh, I had interactions with that group almost every week. And I know our product teams had interaction with that group uh, every week as well. And because there, there's always something to be thinking about, whether that's competitors changing pricing, whether that's technology changes, or whether that's opportunities to price more, there's always something to be analyzing, looking at, and optimizing. Um, and, and, and I think that um, regardless of where it goes, I've seen organizations have it in marketing, I've seen them in, in product, I've seen them in sales, I've seen them in finance. It, it is kind of the bouncing ball, you know, or the hot potato, I guess, is another way to think of it. You never, there's not a dedicated home, but I definitely agree with, with Stephen, rather than focus on the technology, it's the output, it's the outcomes that we should be thinking about, and that's where the responsibility lies. And I think that depends on the organization. In, in the organization that, that we had it initially, uh, the, the, the product marketing team had a much stronger um, uh, responsibility for, for pricing at that point in time. Well, is it fair to say that there is an industry that's figured it out? Like, haven't the airlines got this nailed? Like, they've all got revenue management departments that are robust, report into typically a CCO. I mean, I, that's sometimes a little bit different by airline, but that's reasonably good rule. Like, haven't they... Isn't that strategic pricing? Yeah, yeah, I think though. But no revenue management department exists in other industries. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a fair point. Airlines are always ahead. Like that industry is such an interesting industry. I think, is it because it's so hard? I think it may be because it's so hard, the margins are so razor thin, or maybe because just the general tech of the plane promotes a tech mindset. But the, it, that industry is always a decade ahead. But I do think that revenue management as an actual department inside all companies would be fascinating. Mm. I agree. Yeah, I, yeah no, I that agree. That just kind of hit me as I was sitting here. I was like, wow. <laughs> now, I, I'm sitting there thinking about it too, and I'm thinking, oh, what, what are the it's a good point. industries have razor thin margin, like restaurants, right? Do the, I mean, yeah, I remember retail. reading an um, article where there was this restaurant that went out of business after about a year and a half. They did a reanalysis of it and they found out that they were selling their plates, you know, that each meal at roughly two or three cents below what, and they just didn't realize it. And they were like, why are they burning cash? And they had to go out of business, but it was a slow bleed, but it was that, that right. thing, right? That right. couple three cents changes, Look, changes the outcome. Dr. Crum had an amazing stat in her presentation yesterday. I don't know if you remember this, but there was a, 
she was talking about the uh, trucking crisis where we didn't have enough drivers or trucks to get 17 goods. minutes. All we needed was 17 more 17 minutes of productivity minutes. from each driver and we would have had no problem. Yeah. And, I mean, and this is this whole, this whole story about optimization is that it's always around the edges. Oh yeah. And that's, that's what's really fascinating. So what I'm gonna do is I, I am gonna uh, open it up for questions. We're gonna go for maybe we're gonna do like one more sort of back and forth here for a second. Um, but we do have mic runners in the room. So if you could uh, put your hand up and then our erstwhile mic runners will uh, give you the mic and then I'll um, sort of switch to that and um, we'll kind of take a few questions from the floor and go back and forth that way. But uh, so let's kind of keep going. So this has been an interesting conversation. What I love about talking to the two of you is that we kind of come out here without a particularly set agenda and then we end up in these really interesting spots. Um, now, obviously we're here at Outperform. Um, uh, Stephen, you've got this great expression that you can't spell profits without PROS, yep. right like that. Uh, and, uh, and so um, as we think about you know, how, what, how what we do and what we're doing at Pros can help in this sort of new world, how do we think about, how would you think about us, Stephen, in terms of driving a stronger CFO, CRO collaboration? And what would you like almost want us to do to do a better job of that? We meaning pros, you're asking specifically? Yeah, like if you're saying yeah. you, got, you can sort of redirect our chief product officer any way you want and ask for anything you want from us. And you're thinking, you know, I've, I've, I've got this collaborative environment, but not yeah. a tool. But what's the kind of stuff that you would want to wave a magic wand and get? So, so I'm going to give a quick disclaimer. I'm about to share my personal opinion, <laughs> not the opinions of anyone 100%, 100%. else. Hundred uh, percent. But I, I actually had a conversation uh, last night with him because I'm just blown. I'm always blown away every time I see <laughs> Pros' product and the the new innovations and things like that. That's why uh, personally I'm just such an advocate, and I always say. Uh, to my organization, to any, anyone that I speak with, like, yeah, you, you can't have profits without pros. <laughs> Grammatically, like literally, right? <laughs> um, but when I think about it from a revenue standpoint, right, there's so many factors, and I'm assuming m many of you in the room have either thought of this or when you're thinking about pricing, there's multiple aspects. There's what will the, the customer say yes to? There's the profit margins of your own business. You think about the share of wallet. You think about growth. You think about all these different things. But there was an added component last night, which is the internal stakeholders, which is the sales team, right? How do we make sure those deals are profitable for them in their compensation plans, right? Interesting. Right. Because happy salespeople mean happy customers because really most customers don't do business directly with a company. They do it with that account team on the ground. And we've all been there. We've, uh, most of us have either been buyers or been sellers like on some side and it's people doing business with people, right? So that added component of how do we make sure that side of it is happy too? Because if they're maximizing their compensation, they're, they're an equal stakeholder, right? That, that's just my personal opinion. Um, and so if you're a buyer, does the buyer have the relationship with that account team to care? And does a really good account team, like I think about our people with pros, like what I hear behind closed doors, the affinity that they have, the actual care that they have for individuals on the other side, that's the organization that I want to breed. But is it but can we make sure all of that is included? So that, that, would, that was the one um, area that really jumped into my head yesterday as I was watching uh, some of those demos and the new innovations that have come out. And I'm like, that would be super cool. And maybe it's already there. I just maybe missed it. Well, no, it's a, it's a great paradigm shift. I love the way you put that, which is people don't do business with a the company. They do business with the account team. That's a very, very interesting yes. way of thinking about it. And uh, that, that can unlock a lot. Well, you know, one of the things that um, I always find interesting in, let's just stay on this kind of human aspect for a second, is that often a barrier to collaboration is this sort of lack of understanding between the teams. And you and I were talking about this yesterday, which is, you know, if you really want to make me feel um, frustrated, I guess, it would be to talk to me like I'm a rubber stamp, mm. right? Like, and I, and I often get, I'm for some reason always at the end of the approval chains, and so, and so I'm, I'm frequently getting a, a series of texts, emails, and, and WhatsApp messages, et cetera, begging me to approve something like I've been like having it in my inbox for like three weeks. But it was like literally arrived moments ago, right? <laughs> and and sometimes, it, it has, sometimes it hasn't even arrived yet, right? Yeah. And so, and it's like, and it's, 
what's frustrating about it sometimes is that no one's asking me to review the idea. Right. They're asking me to move it through the queue, mm -hmm. right? um, which is fine. You know, sometimes we do it, sometimes we don't. But, but there's, a, I think, a little bit of the barrier in the collaboration is when we treat each other as barriers mm. as opposed to treating each other as partners. And Stefan, you know, like, I'm sure this is something you've had to deal with through your career. Oh. Finance is often viewed as an obstacle to be surmounted <laughs> as opposed to a, a partner to be sort of consulted. So maybe talk to us a little bit about how that feels and what's the best way to work with finance. And then if you're going to create a more productive relationship with a CRO, like how would you coach that CRO up? Well, yeah, I mean, you said the word, it's relationship, and that was something I said at the, at the outset. It's so important to, to develop that relationship. Again, going back to the, the, the desire to be moving fast. In order to move fast, we almost have to know each other so well that I know what you're looking for and you know what I'm looking for, so I inherently build it into whatever program or whatever thing we're trying to do because I have an appreciation and a knowledge uh, of what you're looking for. Yeah. And to your point, um, I think what slows business down is the, is the lack of that, that relationship, the lack of that, that building of trust. Um, to your point, I, I don't know that people actually view me as a rubber stamp, or I think they view me as a cog in the wheel. So in other words, okay. to your point, I, I, you know, the bigger the dollar item, the typically the more likely I am to have right. to approve it. Right. And I think a lot of people view me as a step in that process, right? So I need, oh, I need Stefan's approval. Oh, can I get approval? No, right? <laughs> so I, I don't know anything about it. I don't, I, there's, I, I don't know what this is for. I don't know what we're gonna, how we're gonna benefit from it. And you can, I almost, you can see the shock on their face. Like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> you have a point of view? <laughs> without, well, with, without your approval, I can't do this project. Yeah, but. I, yeah, but so they, they focus on the approval more than focusing on the, you know, the, the business case, the, the rationale, the, you know, the, the, well, as the panel here was talking about, what is really going to drive, what's the outcome it's going to drive? Mm. How is it going to benefit us? And by the way, should we, should we be thinking about it or we should be thinking about another program? Uh, you know, there are so many things to decide, but what happens a lot of times is, in the interest of speed, people are just moving, saying, I know I wanna accomplish this initiative, I need to go do it, and oh yeah, I need your approval to make sure I get this done, without stopping and saying, wait a minute, let's make sure we're all on the same page and we're driving the right outcome, because if we do that, speed will happen. So it's kind, of, it's kind of counterintuitive, in a way, right? Invest the time early, that way the speed yes. can come later. But if you don't invest the time early, you lose the ability to move fast. Yeah, that's a great comment. Any comment? Um, so, Stephen, anything on that? Um, you yeah, have... I, I think this is probably one of the biggest shifts. What, what you said is, I'll give you an example. In any, there's very different customer processes, right? I'll just share with you again, personal opinion, personal experience, just what, what I've seen over the, over the years with, with customers. You have some processes where it's very, we'll say process oriented. So for example, in a sales process, the vendor is shoved through procurement, like there's, that's one way. There's others where every business unit has, you know, certain stakeholders, but they're still like very closed. My, my point in bringing the different process to the table is what I've seen works the best is the transparency, is the relationship and being, being more open, right? Now, am I, do I know for sure that everybody has an agenda? Yes, <laughs> that, that's all of us. Like that doesn't change. So, you know, I share with my team sometimes, just be open and honest with what your business priorities are, because then maybe the other side will be there. But like you have, like for example, um, at the very, very beginning of any process, if we find something, I tell my team, like you, you better know the CMO, the CRO, the CEO, the CFO, if they bring me into a meeting, the first thing I do, I don't do business cards anymore, right? At the end of a meeting, I'll say, hey, what is your cell number? And I'm forwarding the my contact card because I want us to have an actual personal relationship, right? But I very much believe in transparency because everybody has the right to say no. 
We all know as companies that we're trying to drive profit, we want to make a sale, we want to procure services or vice versa, partnerships, it's all there. And it's, it cracks me up that we sometimes, I still see it to this day, like we, we're playing this chess game. Now it's not my style, right? I'm very open. I know not everybody's like that. We all are, have to be empathetic, let people operate in their own style. But what I feel like really works is like, I'll text stuff, and I'm like, it might be two, he's busy, I'm busy. Sometimes I text him, and he'll text me, it's like two weeks later before we respond, but it's, but we understand that, right? We don't have to apologize or something, you know, because... Well, you know, you're spot on. The first time you and I met, uh, that's how we closed the call. Hey, I want your cell number. I remember thinking, hmm, yeah, okay. You know. <laughs> like, what are you going to do? Uh, yeah. You could say no, but I put him on the spot, because I knew, like, nine times out of ten, they're not going to say no. Yeah. So it is my... Was it really his number, or was it, like, five, five? No, I texted no, him no, right no, away, okay. and I, I, I made him on the phone. I go, wait, did you get it? Like, what number did it come from? <laughs> nice. Just to validate. Yeah, did. Oh, very cool. I love that. Uh, no, and we do. We text uh, quite often, actually. Yeah. That's awesome. But it does feel to me like one of the things that we're missing, and you and I could work on this a lot more, is that there's... There's new stories coming up all the time now about companies that are driving profitable growth. I'll give you one example. Uh, Airbnb recently made a very radical shift in their advertising and marketing strategy about, about a year ago. Uh, they had been very reliant on Google search ads. And there's a lot of logic in buying Google ads uh, for a company like uh, Airbnb because they're intent-based. You know, I want a place to stay in Arizona, whatever, right? And so being there at that moment there's a really natural argument that makes a ton of sense. Um, but they were very costly. And there's a lot of competition, because there's a lot of competition in that space. And now they're competing with all the hotels. Like just, just, they're expensive. And so they tried something very radical. And it feels to me like there was some collaboration going on in the company, because I think part of the reason why people are afraid to try new things is they're afraid to be the one that took the risk and it's their fault. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? And this is where partnering can help a lot, because when it's a group of people coming forward with an idea, it's always safer and more thought through. And so the idea that they had was, let's go to mass media, TV, bus shelters, like mass, old fashioned mass media and stop with the Google ads. And it's been a significant increase in business mm -hmm. oh. and much more efficient. That's which funny. actually, there is a whole school of thought in marketing, which is, one of the reasons mass media is an effective tool is that it's very efficient because it reaches large numbers of people. Um, and there's, there's, the, there's the high targeting story, and then there's the mass marketing story. And, and it, but that's like, I, when I looked at that and I read that case, I can't remember where I read it, maybe Atlantic or something, it was just, I thought, I was jealous for a second because I thought, there's somebody who was allowed to take a very big risk. Because the Google ads are really measurable. Like they're really, like there's a lot of comfort in, there's a lot of like yes. coats you're putting on with Google ads. And someone was able to take a big risk and there was some support system there that allowed that risk to happen and it's paid off. And so I think that there's probably something in this new era of AI and learning and knowledge where maybe we can share with each other ideas for each other yeah. and work together on it. And I think that, that could help. But um, let me pause for well, a second. Dude, I want to just make a comment yeah, on that. that. You know, what, what may sound crazy is I'm actually in favor of big bets. I, I know that that sounds counterintuitive, but as long as we're all in, right. like if, if we decide we're gonna make a bet, I, it, it's not just a, or, or if, we're, if we're working with, with Microsoft as a partner, if we decide we're gonna make a bet, it's not just a phrase or a slang. I, what gets me energized and really supportive of it is that we're all in. It, you know, the whole idea that we're gonna succeed together or we're gonna fail together and what I have found over the course of my career, when you really create that type of an environment, your odds for success are nearly 100%. Interesting. It's, it's when you're not all in right. that right. all of a sudden it's like, yeah, we're gonna make a big bet, but we'll see. We'll just see if it works out. Well, then your odds go way down. Burn but if both. you and I are like, right. let's make this bet and let's make it work, you, I, yeah, 100% we'll, yeah. yeah. we'll find a way to yeah. make it work. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Um, do we have questions from the audience? Really? You're not going to, really? None of us? No My anxiety questions? level just went way down because I was really? like, what's wow. somebody going to ask? Oh, jeez. Okay. Um, oh, I see oh, a hand in the back. There we go. Okay. There we go. There's one brave soul who's, uh, 
We will answer almost any question, but <laughs> last Thursday's off bounds, sorry. <laughs> so I'm really interested in trust. You know, you trust. guys were talking about trust and pace. Sorry, just, sorry, I apologize, but do me a favor, stand up. Oh, man. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> and, no. and do us a favor, do us a favor, just quickly introduce yourself to all of us so we know kind of who you are and where you're from, and then hold the microphone a little closer to your mouth. That'd be okay. great. So um, my name's Nick, uh, Nick Zoe. Um, I work for Virgin Atlantic. Um, I'm head of e-commerce. Awesome, awesome, um, thank you. So um, when it comes to trust, um, in Virgin Atlantic, trust is a big thing. Um, the reason why trust is a big thing, because we believe um, nobody comes to work to do a bad job, right? So everybody trusts that employee. But we also work at pace. And I, I, I understand the governance behind going to the finance people and asking them to support. But the market is changing rapidly, right? FX rates are globally changing every single day. Mm -hmm. And we're chasing the revenue to make sure that we're profitable. But we always can't go through the governance process. Love your thoughts on that. Wow. Very interesting. interesting. OK. So, so I oh, didn't, I mean, I've heard most of that. Can, um, so and I, you know, I'm, increased velocity has caused more changes to be done by employees on a day-to-day -day basis as, for example, FX rates are fluctuating yep. rapidly. Um, and the existing processes, I think you're saying, the existing processes are too clunky to be responsive in a day-to-day -day basis. So how do you trust employees to do it without having to go through the approval process that's been in place with finance traditionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I go back to, I'll, 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 I'll start with that. Um, you know, that's, that's an area that I, I think we could get very aligned on if we work together. Because I, um, I'm a fan, I'm not a big fan of everything coming to me. I, I've, I've often say this to, to people um, in the organization, I'm the last person who should be deciding whether we hire a person in marketing. Grad's much better suited, or even people who report to grad are much better suited at making that decision than I am. So what do I need to do to make sure that grad and his team are executing in a way that fits our profitable growth strategy? Well, I gotta put parameters around it to, to give them the flexibility to do the things they need to do on a daily basis. So uh, going back to the relationship aspect that we're talking about, hearing your pain point there and understanding the need to move fast, then what we would need to do is just build, I would need to, I would need to spend time with you to say, hey, when you came and approve, when you came to ask me for approval to change something with pricing or, or currency related, um, I would just wanna work and educate your team on, here's what I would think about, here's the things I'm concerned about, let's build processes and controls around it such that you're, you're kind of thinking the way I'm thinking. So if we can't do something automated, Let's put something manually in place that allows you to operate with the same kind of uh, awareness that I have and the constraints that I'm thinking about. And if I can do that, then I can give you the ability to move faster. And that's, that's how I think about it, kind of going to what Stephen said. I'm speaking on behalf of Stephen here. Haynes <laughs> uh, uh, Express are not necessarily those. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. But that's how I think about it. Because I, I think you bring up a really good point that there are so many things that we're much better suited solving at the point where the responsibility lies, going back to the theme that, that Stephen was talking about. And we need to empower, but also put the controls in place so people can do that. And I, I think that's the, the right way to approach it. So, but it starts with that relationship. We gotta build that relationship. It does strike me that this is an example of why we know there's a missing category. Yes. Like if there was a piece of software that could have like we have governance, compliance, audit trails, all that stuff set up, and you could set the rules in the yep. software, and then people could you know do it. And if we need to go back and audit and understand the decisions that were made, it's there and it's trailed. Yep. But the problem is everyone's doing these things in Excel, right? And that's where, then that's I think we may have just overnight eclipsed the existing manual systems. So. And these kinds of problems are going to just be yeah, absolutely. Amplified. Yeah, something that Grads in his keynote earlier. I mean, it's your question is phenomenal, right? Because I was even thinking about the trucking trucking industry, and you said something about the prediction is if the trends are going up, and if I think that that was in your keynote where he's like, if gas prices will be yeah. you know twenty cents higher, price, that, uh, that, that could make a difference yeah. in in your pricing, right? 
Um, and this is, I promise you, this was not meant to be a commercial, but I'm like, that's why you need pros. Like, literally, it's just, it keeps coming full circle. And I'm like, wow. Like, how amazing would that be to give that level of trust? Because you know the process is in place, right? So you get trustworthy people, you have a trustworthy process, and you have a trustworthy technology, right? And it's just, that's, that's to me, like, the order of trust, so to speak. Um, it's uh, it's simple, not easy. Is that is that the the verbiage, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we don't we don't have an FX predictor right now. But imagine if we do. Like what we do right now with price predictions is that we we tell people what we think the band should be and let them make a decision, mm -hmm. and they can make a decision with guidance, right? And so you could have guidance around many other things that are part of the profit and financial picture, and then you've got it instantiated in a platform where you can track, manage, and sort of implement it. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a cool question. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Uh, are there any other questions? Really? Such a shy crowd. Oh, there is one. OK, great. Um, go ahead. Are you it's very me? bright on stage, by the way. That's why we do this thing with our hands. It's not, we're not saluting. <laughs> can um, you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Hold the mic very close to your mouth. OK. Uh, my name is Juan. I'm uh, from Holcim. Uh, it's a manufacturing company of cement and uh, all kind of construction building materials. And my question is around we're, we're living a huge transformation with the AI thing and so on. So for these kind of companies that might be uh, have our old fashioned mindset and so on. Any piece of advice to bring people to uh, this new wave, this revolution? How would you treat? I mean, you, you work for companies that might be at the front run of, of, of the thing, yeah. but these kind of companies are just keep trying to keep ahead or trying to keep up with changes, and, and people is the most important yeah. uh, piece of that. So. Any piece of advice on, on how to bring people to, to this new revolution, the, the new changes? May I share a story of uh, two weeks ago with this same situation? So I was actually at a CEO offsite, right, of a customer. They invited me to be part of their board meeting, town hall, um, just to really understand. And this goes back to the relationship and just truly understanding your, your customer, right? But I'm sitting in one of the meetings, and this whole thing of AI comes up. You have the product officer, and, and I'm just cracking up and, and you know, just watching this, because they're basically infighting and, and showing, sharing different um, perspectives. One is like, hey, well, the government's coming out with all these legislations. We're good on AI, all these other things. Um, you know, the, the, the CEO is like, you know, the CISO is all about security, and well, we don't know. This is so new, blah, blah, blah. And somebody uh, says, you know, well, everybody else is doing it. <laughs> And somebody goes, but that doesn't mean that's why we should do it, right? And I'm just watching. This is going back and forth for like five, ten minutes, right? Because, you know, you just always have different sides of, of thought. And they're all correct. So finally, I raised my hand, you know, like a little school kid. I'm like this. And they're like, yes. And so I asked the question, and somebody used the word velocity. And this goes back to something Grad was saying around fear. And it's... In my opinion, in that scenario, it's all about storytelling because you are dealing with people. You're trying to overcome fear because people are like, if I risk this, how much could I lose? So there's a probability analysis. So I kind of, you know, they were talking about the velocity at, at which AI is coming about and can we trust and can we do all these things? And I said, listen, all these are fair assumptions. But when you think about velocity, let's use another analogy again for storytelling. And let's say you're on the, the Autobahn and like all of a sudden the government says, okay, it's, it's full open season and everyone's going 200 miles an hour and you're on the Autobahn going zero. How long are you really gonna survive? It doesn't mean you do something because someone else is doing it, but there's also the other side of what's the risk if you don't. You could get rear-ended, people are gonna pass by you and some people do take the wait and see, but there's also maybe an in-between where if you're going fast enough for your comfort level, you don't get run over, right? But is the risk of not joining, is the risk of not being you know, in the 99% that, that's moving forward, 
I, I don't know. You just put it back on someone who has maybe fear to really think through it logically, right? Because most people do things based on emotion, but they justify with logic. Um, I tend to help customers think through both of those, right? But it was just really interesting to watch the dichotomy between two sides um, and then come together and say, okay, well, let's partner, right? From a perspective of with others that are going down this space. So we're not just in this bubble by ourselves. So, so I think, you know, a combination of, of those two to three things is storytell, logically help them overcome the fear, and then partner with others that are doing this in that space so they don't feel alone, which goes back to the emotional side of it. So I don't know if that's helpful, but uh, it seemed to be helpful two weeks ago, and, and uh, we're off to the races doing, doing things in a way that makes sense for that customer. That's a good formula. I'd say also don't call it a revolution. Um, that, that don't scare people. Yeah. Yeah. Just like, you know, how are we going to stay competitive? And uh, story tell around people who made changes to stay competitive. But, you know, if you think about how we were doing business 100 years ago, nothing we were doing then is what we're doing now. And so we're going to have to keep evolving. Everyone knows that. And just do it in a way that doesn't look too scary. Yeah, I think one other thing, I completely agree with what you both said. Um, most employees want to be a part of a winner. Yeah. They want to be a part of a winning Great organization. Yeah. And I think harnessing that emotion as a part of this initiative is, is, a, is, an, is another dimension to think about. Um, I know I mentioned earlier about making big bets and the way in which I found that, you know, you can get people in and you get people all in is on the idea and the aspect of winning. In, in being the winner in that in, in whatever endeavor you're looking at, um, it's it's a positive it's a it's a and it's an energizer and so I think that's another aspect to harness and but first of all I think you're thinking about it right as you get into this thinking about how you're going to change the hearts and minds is first and foremost. All right, well, we are at time, gentlemen, and as always, it's been a pleasure. I've particularly enjoyed this conversation today. I feel like. We're inventing things on the stage here. This is super fun. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, yeah. uh, so I'll, I'll, uh, I don't, I don't have. I'll do a quick wrap at the end. But any last thoughts or any last words? Maybe you know, everyone's here at Outperform, or we're here physically together for the first time in four years. Um, as people kind of leave and and get on their planes and trains and, and automobiles to kind of head back home, uh, what would you want people to be thinking about and thinking about what they do with what they've learned in the last few days? My big thing is don't be afraid. Most people are afraid when there's an unknown. So just be in the know. Get with partners, get with people, but um, fear should never drive us. Um, it's okay to be fearful. I, I'm afraid of something, I'm sure, all the time, right? But um, spiders specifically, but um, oh, you know. Oh, okay. You know. Huh. Moth, how about this moth that's been flying around? The this moth thing? actually yeah. freaked me out for a second. <laughs> and I was like, I was that person, you know, high pitched scream in the back, that was me. Um, but yeah, just, We've got to move past the fear. It's okay to be that way, but you know, surround yourself with people and uh, don't stay in the unknown. Cool. I I would I would echo that. Um, I think by virtue of the fact that you're here and the whole theme of what we're what we're about to you know is to educate, learn more about how you can take technology and in uh, in the uh, the plans to take back to your companies so that you're able to outperform is really. I know that's kind of cliche to say, given this is what this is called, but that's really what we're about, is taking these circumstances and helping you find a way to actually shine through it all. And um, I'm super excited that you came. I'm actually so glad I got to be a part of this, because um, there's a lot of energy that I get in talking to a lot of our customers about how they're, with, with what they're doing, where they're going. Uh, that gives me a lot of energy, and, and it actually helps me go back and do my job. Awesome. Um, I kind of last, my last thought would be, you know, life is frightfully short. Um, the average human only gets 3,700 weeks. In 3,700 weeks, it's such a tangible number. Like, you can count those down. And so as we look at the tech that's being invented and the things that are being rolled out, what makes me excited is how much more you can do with the little time that we have on the planet uh, to achieve more. And I, I'm like, I'm not afraid of any of this stuff. I don't think anyone should be because the opportunity to do more in the time that you have is so great. And so grab onto it and leverage it and you know, help both your companies and yourself do more with your time and make your time more valuable. I think it's a very, very exciting time in human history. And 
Uh, people will look back on this time, I think, a couple hundred years from now and think, wow, it must have been amazing to have been alive when all of that was coming out all at once. And so I cherish that. And thank you for your time and attention. Thank you to the two of you. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you all online in the fall when we do part three. Uh, who knows what we'll be talking about then. <laughs> uh, or if we'll even, you know, maybe we'll be robots by then. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and it was great. So thanks for the time. Thanks for the um, uh, energy. And we will uh, see you in the rest of the conference. <laughs>